Hello, welcome to week 15. We are almost at the finish line. This week we're going to look at the middle section of the Plague of Doves. And we're going to start with the section titled The Way Things Are. And a lot of my, uh, I suppose, presentation or discussion this week is going to center on, among other things, making sure you're clear on what's happening and who's doing it, because this novel gets a little dense as far as character. Well, it's no surprise, you see on the beginning of this slide, uh, instead of catching a fish, Geraldine catches a turtle. And not just any turtle, but a turtle that she and her first lover uh, caught many, many years ago. Uh, in fact, they carved their initials on the shell of this turtle, and when they catch it now, uh, the initials are still carved there. Now, on one level, especially for Anton, that just seems like cataclysmically lousy luck uh, that you catch the turtle that reminds the person you're trying to woo of a previous boyfriend. Um, but I would ask you, sort of, why is this significant? How might we read the turtle symbolically? Well, uh, in a lot of Native American cultures, the turtle is sort of uh, a sacred animal. <clears throat> there are even Native American stories of the world sort of sitting on the back of a turtle. A turtle is certainly a long-lived uh, animal. So the suggestion here is perhaps this love that Geraldine had for the person who came before Anton uh, has lived all of this time. Something to watch out for generally in this novel <clears throat> excuse me, is symbolism through the use of animals. Um, we're going to see another one a little bit later, and then in the third section we see more. Uh, animals pop up occasionally in this novel, and on one hand, that's significant because animals are significant in many Native American cultures, including the Ojibwe culture. Um, but it also just works sort of literarily as symbolism, so keep an eye out for that. But the turtle here certainly is not only an actual reminder of this previous relationship and, and what comes along with that, but a symbolic reminder as well. So we've talked a little bit about the plot and the characters and how they're all interacting. Um, something else to keep in mind, though, uh, in this chapter, is we're actually also getting a lot of background information about place. Uh, we learn some important info uh, about the rural life that continues to take place around the reservation in Pluto. And this might seem very dull uh, at first, and certainly the kind of thing you read over in anticipation of getting to more exciting character and plot moments. Um, but on page 91, for example, it says, uh, as he's just sort of telling us about the town, we've begun to switch our economic base away from farming. Well, that's so exciting. That's actually not exciting, but it's informative. And what I mean by that is we have read several novels now, and one of the things they have almost all had in common is a reliance on agriculture. Think back to Ethan Frome. Think back to Weinsberg or Bless Me Ultima. Um, agriculture, for the better part of 238 years, 239 years, um, has been the backbone of rural and agrarian culture in the United States. Suddenly, that's not the case. Uh, why would they be switching their economic base away from farming? Well, farming is not as lucrative. It doesn't put food on the table, which is very ironic if you think about it, uh, for rural inhabitants and citizens the way it once did. Um, so this tells us a lot of things. For example, they're getting tax incentives now. So rural locations are becoming less sort of independent. One of the great images of the rural from, I suppose, yesteryear is self-reliance. But now tax incentives bring industry and manufacturing to rural places or just outside of rural places. Um, and there is a reliance of that rural place on the tax incentives that bring manufacturing and industry there. Um, it's also worth noting that many towns around Pluto have started to become deserted. They're folding. They're going under uh, because they're not attracting anything other than farming. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's important, that this town is sort of being more active in trying to rescue itself than other towns. Uh, and again, as I said, a focus on manufacturing. We also learned that the reservation has fought to keep its status with the U.S. government. So we've talked about how these two cultures have started to commingle. Um, vulgarly, I suppose you could say they've interbred. Um, and yet, 
there is an attempt on the part of the American Indian Reservation to keep its identity. So yes, in some ways, we have a new synthesized rural culture, but not fully. The reservation, the native culture is not uh, being blended away. And then when we get to town fever, uh, we switch. Uh, Anton Kautz tells us about his grandfather, uh, Joseph Kautz, and his story and his journey. Uh, and I'm not going to sum it all up here. You can read it. Um, but he is ends up on the party that goes out to survey and explore the land that will eventually become Pluto uh, and the reservation. Now, uh, there are a lot of things that happen plot-wise in this section. Um, we're not going to go over all of those. But I think it's important to ask, how is this perspective on the small town? In other words, uh, arrival of the European uh, descended whites. And it's, it's sort of colonization, different from what we've seen before. And why is it an important perspective? Well, think about the books we've read. Um, there are a few lines in Ethan Frome about Starkfield, these sort of older families versus the newer arrived immigrant families. Uh, we get a little bit about Weinsberg's settlement, but we don't really see it happen. Uh, even in Bless Me Ultima, the town is sort of always there. We hear about times before the town, but we don't really learn about when the town arrived. Um, I suppose we do get some information about the creation of the bottoms in Sula. Um, certainly, um, Hopewell in In Country feels like it has always been there. But this is sort of an illusion. There was a time in any small town, certainly in the United States, uh, when European settlers first arrived. And that goes against the sort of established narrative of the small town and the rural that we've talked about elsewhere. The idea that they're resistant to change because it's always been this way. Well, as a point of fact, it hasn't always been this way. And we see that in great detail in this section. <clears throat> they arrive and there's nothing here. They build the first structure to take shelter in. Uh, before that, this was not the town. So there is a start point even in the American rural, even though that culture, in some ways, uh, it's important to them to have the illusion that it's always been here. It hasn't. Um, and that, of course, also rolls into the role of nature in rural life and how dependent it is on time and location. Nature is a much bigger force for these explorers who have arrived here than it is for the town of Pluto in the 20th century. So we talked a while ago about the story of the turtle, and I sort of walked you through how to consider the turtle symbolically, as well as just something that shows up in the plot of the story. In the emissary, we get an otter, another animal. Um, I'm not going to explain the symbolism of the otter, but I want to point it out to you as another opportunity for you to consider the symbolism. There is no right and wrong answer. Um, if you hear me say, which I'm sort of saying, you figure it out, and your reaction is, well, I don't, what if I get it wrong? You really can't get it wrong as long as you're supporting it with the text that you've read. Um, I bring this up because there may or may not be, uh, for example, a question about different types of symbolism uh, later in the course that it might be useful for you to have thought about this, not just with the otter, but with any sort of symbol that you encounter. Uh, I think the otter has symbolism, particularly for the character as he interacts with it, but also for the story as a whole. So consider the otter. I know that sounds like a really bad romantic poem, but consider the otter. So I'll confess, the first time I read The Plague of Doves, I had to draw a family tree to keep track of who is related to who, because it gets very, very confusing. Um, but as we get into the section titled Lafayette Peace, uh, it's worth noting um, that even though they get hard to follow, they really are important to consider. So for example, just to walk you through some of it, Lafayette and Henri Peace, the guides, the, the two guides that take uh, the party, including Anton Kautz's grandfather, out into the wilderness that would become Pluto. They're brothers, uh, both with each other, uh, but also to Cuthbert Peace, who, if you remember from Musham's story, is one of the natives who dies in the lynching 
Okay, so the Buckendorfs, who are on this ex exploration party with Couts and with the Peace Brothers, um, they would later participate in that lynching. And Sister Mary Anita, the nun from Evelina's school, uh, is their descendant. She descended from the Buckendorfs. Uh, also, Billy and Maggie and Corwin Peace are descended from Henri Peace. Billy uh, and Maggie, brother and sister. Billy we'll see again actually in just a little while. Um, and Corwin, who goes to school with Evelina, are descended from Henri. Now, is it important to be able to recite this entire family tree? No. You're not going to be quizzed on the entire family tree, although I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility that you might see an occasional quiz question about maybe who is related to who else in a one-to-one -one sort of way. Um, but there's a more important reason that these complicated relationships are important. Um, and that is because it is a characteristic of this rural place. And I would argue something of a characteristic of most rural places, because you have a small, relatively small population, because a relatively small number of people leave, uh, intermarriage between families and between maybe different settlements or towns within, say, a county or something, um, is much more common. If you live in a city, Chances are generations can pass on to generations to generations to generations, and nobody's going to intermarry unless you're royalty, I suppose. Um, that is not as true in rural places. And the reason that's important is because sort of family lines are drawn. You know, the pieces sort of resent the Buckendorfs. The people on one side of the uh, lynching I think justifiably resent the people who were on the other side of it. But the reality here, if you can keep track of it, is that there are no sides. The people that were on one side two generations ago have now married or had a child with somebody from the other side. Um, or, you know, the sort of blood feuds carried forward, uh, that might be an exaggeration, but the, the grudges, I suppose, carried forward in this novel um, become messy for that reason. Now, that is not just to say, okay, here's a fact, uh, families tend to intermarry more in rural places, uh, but that is also something we can read on to what we identify with rural culture. Um, it's hard to have multiple cultures in one place. We even see it here where the native culture and the uh, European culture sort of uh, synthesize and, and to some extent uh, collapse into each other, but certainly a place like Weinsberg, everybody knows everybody, not just because they're neighbors, but because if you go searching on the family tree, the branches will intertwine. And I, I don't mean that in sort of like a, a hillbilly sort of way, um, but just, you know, past a certain point of, I suppose, cousinness, um, that's pretty normal in rural places. Um, probably happens in urban places too, but it's much more the norm. So once the, the story of the discovery and the surveying of Pluto in the distant past is over, we end up more uh, in nearer the present. Um, and Come In is a section that starts with Billy Peace, uh, again, a descendant of uh, Lafayette and Henri, uh, shows up at John and Nev's door trying to extort John. Turns out John uh, has had an affair John Wildstrand has had an affair with Billy's sister, Maggie. Um, and so Billy wants to sort of make it right, but he also wants to make some money off of it. But he's not very good at what he does. Um, now, here's another moment where we draw the lines. Remember, Nev is uh, the historian who showed up at Evelina's house in a much earlier chapter. If you remember, nobody liked her. Um, so, John, who is smarter than Billy, uh, at least at this point in the novel, uh, convinces him not to do what he set out to do, and instead they hatch a plan to kidnap Nev to get the money and split it between them. Um, it clearly does not go quite as planned as sort of amateur kidnappings often don't. Um, something else to keep in mind, John Wildstrand, who is working with Billy here to kidnap Nev and get the money, uh, his grandfather is one of the people who lynched Maggie and Billy's relative, Cuthbert 
piece, right? So John Wildstrand uh, is descended from the Wildstrand that did the lynching. Maggie and Billy Peace are descended from Cuthbert Peace, Henri and Lafayette's brother, who was lynched. So again, sort of the sins of the father are visited forward here, um, but it's never as clean as anybody wants it to be. So Billy and John's plan sort of works, sort of doesn't. Billy ends up getting out of town and joining the military. Uh, John's wife, Nev, sort of discovers what he has done, um, and it all falls apart. And then that chapter ends, and we start a new chapter called Marn Wold. Now, here's something you're going to like about Marn Wold. She's not interrelated with all of these other families. She is neither Peace, nor Wildstrand, nor Buckendorf. Uh, or anything else that we have encountered so far. She lives out on the farm with her mother and her father, um, and her uncle, I believe, and seems to live a, a, a sort of quiet, uneventful life until a traveling evangelist shows up at their door. And this traveling evangelist, surprise, surprise, is Billy Peace. He has gotten out of the military, and he's gotten much bigger. He's sort of a larger... I guess, sort of almost obese person now. Um, and that's where they meet. So some things about Marn. Um, she's young, uh, still a teenager. Uh, she lives on the farm with her family. They're poor. Um, we get this nice, significant passage. Uh, she says, Looking into my father's eyes, you would see the knowledge, tender and offhand, of the ways roots took hold in the earth. So again, we've seen this a few times, this connection in rural culture to the earth, to the land. Think of Jesse Bentley. Think of, to some extent, of Ethan Frome, uh, although he sort of forsakes that to pursue Maddie. Um, but the idea that it's a special rural quality to know the land, to know how to work the land. Um, so this is what Marn comes from. And then Billy says, hey, you're kind of cute. You want to go to a revival meeting that I'm going to have. And she goes. And she sort of falls in love with him very quickly, and they get married. And you might read this and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Marn is a teenager. This is weird. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but it would have been much more common uh, in this time, which I, I think we're in like the 1950s here. Um, it would have been much more normal for someone to get married that young, especially in a rural place. So, Billy uh, starts out as sort of a, a backwoods traveling evangelist, but uh, he's very charismatic. And with Marn at his side, they attract followers, and he becomes, you know, he starts broadcasting on the radio and becomes very, very well known. Um, and as that happens, his theology, um, which starts sort of very Protestant Christian, uh, starts to evolve. Uh, he becomes more focused on eschatology, which is just a fancy word for the study of the end times. So if you know somebody who likes to study, say, the book of Revelation in the Bible, uh, they are studying eschatology, the way uh, religions tell us the world will end. Um, so it's worth asking, how is this similar to our ideas of the rural so far? Well, certainly a sort of more fundamentalist type Christianity uh, is something we often connect with the rural. Um, and I, I think that a, an interest in eschatology also lines up there. But if you ask how it's different, well, eventually Billy sort of starts to ditch the Christianity. It becomes almost more of a new agey. Um, it talks about how he stopped talking about God or Jesus or something in one town and, and moved on from that. Um, so what starts out as very sort of familiar, uh, folksy, sort of mid-20th century revival-based Christianity becomes uh, something different. It almost becomes, well, it does become a cult. Um, in fact, after Billy and Marn have their two children, Marn decides she wants to go home. Now, her reasons for wanting to go home are very altruistic, very pure. We get that she says the idea of home or folks or a place you grew up in that you want to return to. Um, certainly, we've seen this before. The people who come back home, uh, Sula, does that. Characters in Weinsberg do that. Um, but when they go back, Billy, who really wants to be in control of everything and is very charismatic, um, basically gets the farm of Marn's parents deeded over to him, and it becomes, uh, for lack of a better way of describing it, I guess, sort of a cult compound, right? 
Um, more people come and stay. They set up really bizarre rules about who can spend time with the kids and when they have services and, and what their money goes to. And before we know it, it really is a, a cult set up on this farm out in the middle of nowhere on Marn's parents' property. So a lot of things happen. I won't go through all the details here. You've read it. Um, but Billy and Marn sort of have a parting of the ways. And uh, she poisons him and then leaves. And then the chapter ends without sort of a final resolution to what happens. Um, and it's interesting that when the next section starts, titled The Four Bs, uh, we don't get the end of Marn's story from Marn's point of view. This is one of those things, you know, we don't talk about maybe as much as we should, because there's always more to talk about than we have time for. But one of the things you need to pay attention to in literature is how the literature is constructed, the craft of the author in how they assemble the book that you're reading. And one tool in a writer's toolbox is point of view. Who's telling the story? Well, in this book, it changes with the characters. Uh, Anton Kautz tells us the story of him and his grandfather. Um, we get Marn's story um, primarily through her point of view. Um, not necessarily in a first person, but in a, a close third, I believe. Um, and that's where the story continues down through Marn's point of view until we get to the four B's. And suddenly, we are back with a character we haven't seen in a while. Uh, Evelina is now finishing high school. She is learning French and wants to go to college. And she's working at this diner. And suddenly, it's her point of view. So when Marn comes in with the kids, we don't have access to Marn's thoughts anymore. We see Marn through Evelina's eyes. And Evelina knows Marn because it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Um, but it's an important question to ask. Uh, another writer might have just finished Marn's story through Marn's point, Marn's point of view. Um, Erdrich doesn't. Why? Why is it important that we see Marn at the end of her story through Evelina's eyes? What's the effect of this choice? Um, I don't know that there's a single right answer to that, but ask yourself, how did you read it differently than you would have if it had just continued in Marn's voice? Um, what effect does it have? Well, one effect it has is it gets us introduced to Evelina again, so there's some overlap there, a sort of transitional period to the new narrator. Um, but I think it also lets us see Marn as others see her, and I think that's important. It lets us see her children as the sort of ragamuffins that they are. Um, it lets us see Marn as somebody who has sort of escaped a cage, but not in the way that we understand it if we had had access to her thoughts. Um, and of course, I've sort of already addressed this, but Evelina has also changed when we see her waiting tables. Um, she is learning French. She does want to go to college, and we'll continue to follow her as we move forward here. And so I want to wrap up the middle section of The Plague of Doves, uh, which ends here in the four Bs, uh, not with the characters. We've talked a lot about the characters, who they are, why they're doing what they do. Um, but I want to once again pan the camera out uh, and... Or actually, I guess I would say, I want to look at a moment where Erdrich pans the camera out and lets us see a little bit of Pluto again. Um, while they're sitting in the diner, this is the view we get through the window. Across from us, there was a gas station and a reeking movie house that showed B movies. At times, a fake flower or decorative basket shop would spring up, some farm wife's hopeful craft project outlet or a second-hand clothing store that smelled of sweat and mice would suddenly appear in an old, closed-down storefront. Does this fit in with our conception of the rural? Um, how does it fit in? Well, I think this is something that, if you go to rural places now, is going to seem much more familiar than it would have to, say, George Willard or somebody you know, a hundred years ago in Weinsburg or Starkfield or wherever. Um, what you have in small rural towns now are a lot of storefronts that can't keep stores. Uh, you have uh, gas stations that are owned by larger corporations. Um, it's, it's unusual to drive through a small town, certainly in Indiana, uh, and see a, a gas station that's independently owned. It's a marathon or it's a kangaroo, or it's a Swifty. 
um, you see stores show up and run for a while until they realize they're not going to make any money and then close again and then reopen because somebody else has bought it. Um, this is sort of the new rule uh, that we are now seeing. And it's problematic, but we also understand why it has happened. Because the things that made small towns sort of prosperous often aren't there. The farms aren't individually owned. They owned by, they're owned by corporations. Uh, the industry that does come in, attracted by the tax incentives um, to provide uh, income, still sends most of its profits elsewhere. Um, so this boarded up street might seem sort of run down, but I think it's important to realize that the main street of Winesburg is, is no longer the rural main street. And, and the one we see through the window of the four B's in this glance is probably becoming more what we recognize. There of course are exceptions. They're lovely storefront small towns throughout even just Indiana that are doing great for one reason or another. But that is more of an exception than a rule. So as we continue to study the rural, as we finish up studying the rural, um, when we move into the final week of class. Um, something to continue to think about is how the rural is now compared to how it was when we started. So thank you for listening this week, um, and I will see you for the final section of The Plague of Doves.